to be here today um, and just to continue our Easter invite challenge this morning and it's so exciting we have a challenge right now to reach or to invite 417 people by 417 and as of today we have reached 459 invites that's awesome right yeah but here's the deal don't give up yet right don't like oh we've reached the goal we don't have to surpass it let's surpass it let's try to double it this week um even um going back to the people that you've already invited to remind them again again this is a amazing time of the year to invite people to church what better opportunity that you have to um, start a gospel conversation with someone by just inviting them to church someone maybe at your work or in your neighborhood um, maybe just go out walking one day with the invite cards that you can pick up on the what's happening next table as you leave this morning and just let's continue to pray let's continue to reach out and invite our friends and neighbors to church this coming sunday and so for the next hour let's join our hearts together let's worship Let's push forward. Let's lean in to God's word this morning. Let's push aside those things that so easily entangle us and to see that Christ has died once, took on the suffering for all of us, and he takes on our, our sin, our shame, our guilt, and he has conquered death. Because of, of God, he has risen from the grave and now lives in our hearts. And now we have victory because Christ victory. So let's join together in prayer this morning. Let's stand as we pray, as we lean in this morning, as we press in a little harder this morning to see and hear, to stir our hearts towards God. God, we love you. And, and we know that in the midst of all the crazy things that are going on in our world, and there are plenty, and too, too numerous to even count, uh, that our hearts can become burdened over, over these things, over these worldly things. And, and I know that even in our own lives, we allow... Um, sin and we allow shame and guilt to to tangle us up we allow negative thoughts about our own self and and to to derail us but god we know that you do not see us that way you see us as we ought to be uh, and so i just pray right now for the ones who are just struggling i pray for those who will just set aside those things right now and just lean in to worship to lean in to hear your word preach this morning god that you would just rescue all of us from ourselves really and just to see you for who you are that you love us let's worship together in christ let me pray amen well, we're going to worship the lord this morning i'm excited are you well here we go let's worship him this morning
picture that we see in Scripture. Jesus resurrected from the grave. I don't know about you guys, but this is true for me. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. I hear doubt running. My God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. Amen. Here we go.
Father reigns above it all. The reign of darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. King of my life, you're the king of my life. Sing it to him this morning. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign. God, you put out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, here an anthem arise. Is Jesus your life? Oh, you reign above it all. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Yes, you reign above it all. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave that's seated alone in glory and thrown on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave that's seated alone in glory and thrown on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave Running out of an empty grave, I see it alone in blue. 
Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. We worship you. Father, prepare our hearts for your word. In your name, amen. Y'all can be seated. Really good to see you. Wonderful to worship with you. What a great time of, of worship. And we are going to see today something, just a, a picture, a part of what it means for Jesus to reign above it all. I am excited to continue to tell you about the three days that changed the world. We started first looking at Thursday night. When Jesus prepared his disciples and he was preparing us as well for the changes that he was about to bring to their lives. And then on Friday, Jesus willingly went to the cross. They didn't make him go to the cross. He chose to go to the cross. We're giving his body to be broken. Where he opened up the access to God by the sacrifice of his blood. God literally reached down from heaven. The Father tore the veil in two to show us that at last access to the Father had been opened through the sacrifice of the blood of his Son. What happened next? We know that before sundown Friday afternoon, they removed Jesus' body from the cross and they very hurriedly prepared it for burial. And then they put the body of Jesus in a tomb, a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was a prominent, probably wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. But he, like Nicodemus, had come to a place where he recognized Jesus was the Messiah and he trusted in him. Joseph had had a tomb prepared for himself. He had had a tomb carved out of the, of the rock and made as his own resting place. But now he was so in love with his new Savior that he donated his tomb for the body of his Lord. So before sundown Friday afternoon and before Friday became Saturday or the Jewish Sabbath, the stone was rolled over the mouth of the tomb. Now looking forward, we know early on Sunday morning that Jesus rose from the dead. He came out of the tomb, and that's what we're going to be looking at next week. We're going to look at how Jesus' resurrection changed the world. But this morning, we are talking about what happened in between the death of the Lord Jesus and that glorious resurrection. Where was Jesus on Saturday? Now, actually, it's not a mystery. The Bible tells us very plainly where Jesus was. However, I, I find in conversation, it's a mystery to a lot of people. It's a mystery to a lot of people because they, they haven't heard or they haven't read the scripture that gives us the answer. Or because they've read it and they, they don't understand it. And there's another reason too, and that is because we 
all are immersed so deeply in a culture that has an anti-supernatural bias that anything that has the flavor of the supernatural, we have a tendency to, to just kind of brush to the side. We may not want to totally put it away, but, but we don't want to get in too deep if it, if it touches on the supernatural. So for all of those reasons, there's a lot of people, maybe you're one of them, that don't know the answer of where Jesus was on Saturday, or you know a little of it, but don't really understand it. So I'm going to ask you right now, would you pray with me? I want to ask you, first of all, I want you to pray for me. This is a prayer I pray for myself all the time, most especially every Sunday. I pray this for myself. I want you to pray with me that God would fill me with his spirit. Because I I recognize I'm not capable of really explaining this to you so that you will understand it and, and benefit from it and be blessed by it just in my own intellect or my own uh, words. I can't do it. I need the Lord to take control and do that. So I want you to ask the Lord to do that in me. Secondly, I want to ask you to pray for yourself that God will fill you with his spirit, that God will control your mind, control your hearing, control your attention, uh, control your retention, so that, that you understand what God declares in his word more clearly, and that God begins to show you where that has application, where that has repercussion in your own life to make a difference for you. You see, all of these things didn't just change the world. They changed people, one person at a time. So so ask the Lord to also show you how this changes you, what difference it makes for you. So let's pray. Would you pray for that? And Lord, I openly pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, that you would give me as a gift from on high the capacity to be able to explain your truth clearly to this congregation who has gathered and wants to learn it. Lord, I pray that you would control my every thought, uh, my every word. Lord, even if there is something that I've prepared and planned to say but, Lord, it's not exactly what you want said, then change it or, or cause me to forget it or to pass over it. Lord, I want the words that I speak not to be really from me. I want them to be from you. So would you control me and use me as that vessel? And, Lord, at the same time, would you control the, the hearing? Would you control the understanding? Would you control the remembering of those that hear your word and hear the explanation of it. And Lord, would you help them to more fully comprehend your glorious truth about how you really do reign above it all and how it's so clearly demonstrated in what you did on that Sabbath day, on that Saturday. And then, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see how that applies, how that changes their own lives. Lord, I pray we will all leave this place saying, Lord, you did what I ask. And we give you thanksgiving and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at God's word. I said God's word tells us where Jesus was, what Jesus did on Saturday. So let's read the text. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, where the Holy Spirit says through Peter, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, 
who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, I want us to take this text and let's make a list of what it says happened. First, it says Christ suffered for our sins. It says he was put to death in the flesh. But then he was made alive by the Spirit. And by the Spirit, Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison. Okay, that's the four things that this tells us. Now, so far, this is not difficult to understand. Jesus suffered and died on the cross. But even though his body was dead, God kept his spirit and soul alive. Now, for those of us who have been in the word for a little while, those who have trusted Christ, this is not strange to us. But because we know God says, describing all of us in his word, every one of us is body, soul, and And spirit. We are made of of three parts. And in fact, death is when the soul and the spirit is separated from the body. We know as believers that today, when we die or some fellow believer dies, that their soul and spirit go immediately to be with the Lord in heaven, but the soul and spirit is separated from the, the body. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's for today. So, Jesus' body was put in the tomb. But his spirit and soul were still very much alive. And the Holy Spirit led Jesus to go preach. Now, that may not excite you, but I can tell you that excites me. That when his body was dead, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus in spirit and soul still to go preach. Now, there's nothing particularly strange here because we know the soul and spirit lives on. So the Holy Spirit to lead Jesus, go somewhere and preach uh, some more. That's not out of character. That's not terribly unusual. But the Spirit led Jesus to go preach to the spirits that were in prison. Okay, here's where folks start to get lost. So this is where you need to put your antenna up. Turn your ears this way and listen really carefully, okay? Who are the spirits in prison? And where are the spirits in this prison? Well, the text again tells us in 1 Peter 3, it says, Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly disobedient in the days of Noah. Okay, that's who the spirits were. Okay, let's narrow this down. There are really two people or one's a group of people uh, not people of of created beings that are called spirits in the bible one is god 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 is spirit the creator the bible says god is spirit that's why we must worship him in spirit and in truth because god is spirit but there's also a group of created beings who are called in the bible spirits in fact they're called ministering spirits you know who they are Hello? Angels. That's right. Angels are called ministering spirits. Okay? So, God is spirit. Angels are also called spirits. Now, the spirits he's talking about in prison are spirits that were disobedient during the days leading up to the flood and Noah in the ark. Now, was that God? Or was that some angels? Well, obviously that was angels. 
You know, obviously that was angels. So he's clearly talking about angels, and he's talking about disobedient angels. He's talking about fallen angels, what the New Testament calls demons. Now, the Bible tells us about this event. The Bible tells us what happened when these fallen angels were disobedient to God. We find it in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Look, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now let's drop down to verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old. Men of renown. Now, let me tell you, in the Old Testament, wherever we find this phrase, the sons of God, in Hebrew it's B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, everywhere that appears in the Old Testament, it refers to the angels. It always refers to the angels. And so, he is... He is telling us that these are the ones that were in prison during this time, the Bible says. And remember, this is a time when men and women were getting more and more wicked. It's the time of which the Bible says that every imagination of their heart and mind was only evil continually. In fact, it was the day in which God only found eight people of faith, Noah and his wife and Noah's three sons and their wives. He only found eight people of faith on whom he poured out his grace and he saved them in the ark. Out of all the population of the world, which could have well been in the number of billions of people by that time, Everybody else was exceedingly rebellious against God and wicked. And so what the scripture tells us happened is that the, these angels that had already rebelled against God, they, they were already fallen angels, but they see all of this wickedness and perversion just engulfing and dominating the culture of humanity on the earth and they are delighted and they decide they will join in with the human wickedness and perversion and they decide that they will join it by taking wives from the humans and so they they find the the human women to be very beautiful and attractive And so they take, now these are very wicked women because all the men, all the women are all wicked on on the earth. And so some of these, maybe all of these were were very willing uh, for one of these fallen angels to become their their husband. Perhaps others were, were taken by force because it also was a very violent time. But the bottom line is, that these fallen angels, these demons, took for themselves wives and they cohabitated with these women and they produced offspring. They had children. But the offspring of this union, from the, the perverted union from a fallen angel and a human woman was not normal offspring. The one characteristic that seemed to be common among all of the children born as a result of the union from the the demon and the, the woman was that they were giants. 
But in addition to that, they had other very abnormal things that made them be uh, called the mighty men of old, people of renown. And, and in English, those almost sound complimentary, but in the Hebrew, they're really not. They're, they're just talking about how they had very unusual characteristics, but they were very strong, they were very violent, and they were very, very large. And they were the products of this union. But for the angels to do this was a gross violation of the very purpose for which God had created them. They were disobedient spirits. And God put the disobedient spirits in a prison. Now, do you know the New Testament refers to this event? twice. First Peter, in, in his second letter, 2 Peter 2, 4, he says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And then Jude says in verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So, who are the spirits in prison? They are those angels that rebelled against God, and in the days preceding the flood cohabitated with women and produced these giants and abnormal offspring. And because they did that, God put these disobedient angels into a prison. Now that leads us to the second question, where was this prison? Where were these spirits in prison? Well, Peter says, if you caught that in Peter 2.4, that God cast them down to hell. And so the prison, he said, is in hell. But listen, the word that Peter uses for hell in the Greek is not the normal word for hell. In Greek, that is, that is Hades. Uh, but, but he doesn't say Hades here. He uses a place name. He uses the word Tartarus. Tartarus was the name of a place and Peter tells us Tartarus was the name of the prison that's where God put them and interestingly now some of you have studied Greek mythology and so you may remember hey I've heard that name in Greek mythology Tartarus was picked up in Greek mythology and it was used as the name for the prison house for the Titans. Do you remember who the Titans were? The Titans in Greek mythology were the original, now listen to this. They were the original sons of God. Isn't that interesting? But you see, the mythology, the Greek mythology has its basis in the truth that is revealed in the Holy Scripture. Now, some may be thinking, no, oh, wait a minute, Brother Mike, how do you know the Scripture didn't pick this up from Greek mythology? Listen, Jesus said the man Moses wrote Genesis. Jesus says that multiple times. Now, I know there are people that, that will argue with that and say, oh, well, Moses didn't really write it. For me, I believe Jesus. How about you? I mean, Jesus said Moses wrote Jesus. Uh, Jesus was there. You know, he knows who wrote Genesis. He knows the truth. So I, I take him at his word. Moses wrote Genesis. And Moses far predates the beginnings of Greek mythology. Even Wikipedia, which is just really a, a collection of what our culture believes today. You want to know where the culture is today? You just look something up on Wikipedia and that tells you, you know, where, what our culture, by and large, believes today. Well, even Wikipedia 
dates Moses as having lived 700 years before the very earliest poems with references to the Greek gods and to Greek mythology were even written. So Moses wrote Genesis seven centuries before Greek mythology even began. So mythology comes later. And usually what mythology does is it picks up on some truth and it expands the truth and then it perverts it. So the biblical statement uh, that, that the prison house where the disobedient spirits had been put was Tartarus, that biblical statement doesn't come from mythology. The biblical statement is the original and perfect truth. It's the mythology that comes later and it gets exaggerated and it's the error-ridden copy. So in the New Testament, the prison house is often called the abyss. You remember reading in the New Testament? You, you hear about the, the abyss? Hello, anybody? Can you move your head? You remember the abyss? It's called the abyss oftentimes in the New Testament. It's also called in the New Testament the bottomless pit. So that is Tartarus. That's where the prison house, and it is located in part of Sheol that was the abode for the dead during Old Testament times. Sheol. How many of you have ever heard the word Sheol? Raise your hands high enough I can see them. Good, good. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you know what it is. Okay? Glad you've heard of it. A lot, you know, there's a lot of believers haven't even heard really the name Sheol. And the reason for that is because although it's a place name, Sheol is the, the name of a particular place. It's a proper name. In most translations of our Bibles, it's not used as a, as a proper name, a place name. It is uh, translated to mean grave or sometimes hell. And so the word Sheol to the English reader is lost. Either it never appears or it only appears two or three times in the Old Testament. But do you know the word Sheol actually is in the Old Testament 65 times? There's a lot of information in the Old Testament about what Sheol is. <coughs> I preach out of the New King James uh, Version. Sadly, even the New King James Version does not translate the word uh, Sheol in most of the places that, that it appears. The only popular versions that properly translate this, that, that you're likely to have today, is the ESV. How many of y'all use the ESV? Yeah, good. That, that is a really good popular Version Probably if I were picking a Bible to preach from uh, today, you know, if I, if I weren't an old man who picked it back when I was 20, you know, and wanted to stick with what I'm, I'm accustomed to, I probably would pick the ESV. It's an excellent, excellent translation from the Hebrew and the, and the Greek. And it translates Sheol as Sheol everywhere that it appears. The other one that does is an older version, the New American Standard Bible. But it also is a very faithful translation, and it translates, translates it as, as Sheol. But here's what you need to know about Sheol. Let me, let me sum this up. But you can, you can look this up. You can look up everywhere the word Sheol appears in the Old Testament and just read the verses in there. Here's what you're going to find. You're going to find out that before Jesus' resurrection... Everybody went to Sheol when they died. Everybody. Old Testament believers like Jacob. Jacob talked with his sons about, I'm going to go to Sheol. Said it multiple times. He, he knew that's where when he died he would go. But not only believers, Old Testament believers went to Sheol... Old Testament unbelievers also went to Sheol, like rebellious Korah, 
uh, Korah, the, the man who led the rebellion against Moses. He and his followers went to Sheol. Now, it's actually Jesus who gives us the most complete description of Sheol. And uh, here's, a, here's a picture uh, that I want you to see that, that is a, a good artistic representation of the truth that Jesus explains and that Peter explains. Now, I'm not trying to say that's exactly, I know exactly what the interior of the earth looks like, but I know these things are there. And so this is a way for us to, to visually understand uh, these places that are in Sheol. And Jesus tells us about this in Luke chapter 16, where he talks about the rich man and Lazarus who died. They both went to Sheol. Now, some people will tell you, you'll find this uh, even in the, in the headers, the subject headers of some, some Bibles will say uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Look at me. This is not a parable. In a parable, Jesus never names names. <laughs> he always just describes the character in a parable. And almost always, when Jesus is telling a parable, the biblical text identifies it as a parable. It says, and Jesus told a parable, or he explained in a parable. You don't find those words about this story. And Jesus tells us one of the characters was named Lazarus. Now, this is not the Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. This is another Lazarus. But Lazarus died about the same time a rich man that, that Lazarus knew also died. They both went to Sheol. But this is no parable. Jesus is telling you a true story about what really happened to these men. The rich man went to a part of Sheol that is called hell. We're familiar with that. Lazarus went to another part of Sheol, another compartment in Sheol that was called Abraham's bosom. It was called that because, get this, Abraham was there. In fact, Jesus tells us about Abraham speaking while he is there in this place that's named after him, Abraham's bosom. Hell was, as it still is, a place of fire and torment. The rich man went to hell in Sheol, and he cried out saying, I, uh, Get me out of here, I am in flames and in torment. And so that is what hell is. Abraham's bosom, though, was a place of comfort, and it was a place of good things. It was sectioned off from, from hell. It was a, a place where all that were there, Abraham and, and Lazarus went, went there. We read in the Old Testament, David went there, Jacob went there, all the Old Testament believers. But it was a place there of comfort and of good things as they were, were waiting. But in between... Abraham's bosom, where Abraham and all the believers were, and hell, where the rich man and everyone else that was in torment and flames, between those two compartments of Sheol, there was a great gulf, a great gulf that separated the two, so nobody could cross from one to the other. I don't know why anybody would want to cross from Abraham's bosom to hell, but there, everybody would have wanted to cross from hell to Abraham's bosom. But nobody could. They, they had to stay where they were. Now I want you to remember something you know really well. You remember when one of the thieves that was crucified with Jesus there on Calvary he repented while he hung on his cross, while he was dying. He acknowledged Jesus and believed in him while he was hanging there on the cross. And Jesus turned to him and he said something. 
He said, today you will be with me in paradise. I knew you all knew that. You will be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say, hey, buddy, today you'll be with me in heaven. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise was the other name of Abraham's bosom. That's where Jesus was talking about. He said, today, you and I, after we die, we are both going to be in paradise. Paradise is where Abraham, Lazarus, Jacob, David, and all the believers were before the resurrection of Jesus. Now listen, I, I don't want you to miss this, because if you miss this, you're going to go out of here say, saying, uh, Brother Mike's crazy. You may say that anyway, but, but listen, maybe we can prevent some of it, okay? After Jesus rose from the dead, Everything I just told you about paradise and Abraham's bosom changed. When Jesus rose, one of the things in the world that changed was everything I just told you about paradise. What I've told you is the way it was before the resurrection. So don't miss next week. When, when we talk about how the resurrection changed the world, we're going to look at the detail of, of this. But all of that changed. That, that's why to, today, when the believer dies, we say to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord, to say we go to heaven. We do. We don't go down to Sheol. But that's because we live and we believe after the resurrection. Okay. So we'll talk about the change next, next week. But on Friday afternoon, after he died, Jesus, in the Spirit, went to Sheol. He took the repentant thief with him to paradise. And then Jesus went further. He didn't stop at paradise. He took the repentant thief to, to paradise, but then the scripture says Jesus went down to the abyss. He went down to Tartarus where the rebellious angels of Noah's day had been imprisoned. They had been in the prison when Jesus went down there now for more than 2,000 years. And he preached. That's what Jesus did. He went down to the rebellious angels to their prison house and he preached. The Greek word for preached here is keruso, which means to announce like a herald giving a proclamation. I am telling you, he went down and he pronounced that now I reign above it all. What we just say. He wanted those disobedient angels who had rebelled against God and then had been so disobedient and tried to pervert humanity in their sin. He wanted them to know that he now was reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he preached. Now let me dismiss a wrong thought. Because there are certain religious groups that believe that when Jesus went down to Sheol, that he went and suffered in hell. That he suffered the, the pain that unbelievers suffer in the flames of hell. That's not true. We read that in our text. Did you notice it said Jesus suffered once for sin? He did his suffering on the cross. It was complete. That's why he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. The debt is completely paid. It had already been paid at the point of his death, the shedding of his blood. He didn't have to pay for sin any further in hell. He didn't go there to pay for sin. Sin had been paid for. He went there to announce. He went there to preach. Now, I cannot be sure... Who all heard Jesus preach? 
I know the disobedient angels in the prison. I know they heard him, but I suspect very strongly that they heard him, those that were waiting up in paradise. You know, that they were able to call from paradise over to Hades. The rich man had a conversation with Abraham. They were, they were able to holler out and hear one another. So I suspect they all heard Jesus preaching. I suspect all of the unbelievers that were in the torment of hell along with the rich man. I suspect they all heard, heard Jesus preaching. I think everybody probably heard him. And get this. If you look at the timetable between when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose from the dead, you have between 24 and 36 hours. Jesus could have preached for 24 to 36 hours and nobody had a watch. <laughs> nobody had a clock. And I think Jesus probably preached the whole counsel of God. I'll bet he started at the very beginning to declare that God and God alone created all of this universe and he created each one of you. And he probably said, and I, in person, I was the agent of creation. And then he told them, and God is holy. Holy, 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 and God cannot allow sin to abide in his presence. He probably told them about how often the prophets had, had told people that God still loved them, even in their sin, that God had a plan so that they could be forgiven of their sin, so that, that when their sin was forgiven, they could be given the gift of eternal life and live in God's family with him for, forever, that God had promised to send a Savior, the Messiah, and then he announced, I am that Messiah. And he told them how he had proved it by fulfilling all the things that had been spoken of him. I, I feel confident he explained what he had just done on the cross in saying, listen, the devil did not defeat me by my death on the, on the cross. It was like the serpent biting my heel. But now on the cross, when I shed my blood and paid the penalty for sin once for all, I stomped the head of Satan. And he is a defeated foe. You have followed the wrong king. And I think while he was preaching to the disobedient spirits in prison, he probably looked up to those that are watching from paradise and listening from paradise, all the believers there who had trusted in him. And I'll bet he said something like, and after I rise from the dead tomorrow, I'm coming back for all of you. All of you believers up there in paradise, after I rise, I'm going to come and gather you up. Because in my Father's house are many mansions, and I'm going to take you to my Father's house where you will live with him and with me forevermore. Oh, there are probably many, many other things that Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, to the others that could hear him there, both in paradise and in hell. But there is one thing that Jesus did not do when he preached there in Sheol. And it's interesting because the one thing that Jesus did not do is something I do almost every time I preach. And that is that Jesus did not give an invitation. He did not say to the rebellious angels in prison, and now you have the glorious opportunity to repent of your sin and trust in me and have your sin forgiven and be saved and live with God who made you forever. He did not give them an invitation because, you see, angels can't be saved. Salvation's only for people. In fact, the scripture specifically says that, that the angels look at God's offer of salvation to men and women by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus who died on the cross. And they look with awe and wonder 
They don't understand it. They cannot comprehend it. It's so marvelous. But it's not for them. And then he didn't need to give an invitation to those who were in paradise because the only ones there were believers. Now, now most of them had believed in Old Testament times where they didn't know all the details about Messiah and everything about the, the cross or the resurrection, but they believed the promises that God had made about the coming Messiah. They believed that in the promised Messiah, they were going to have a Savior. And they believed what the prophet Isaiah said, that, that he was going to die for sin and he would pay the penalty for sin and that by the shedding of his blood and by his death, we could all be saved and we could live with God forever. And with it not having yet happened, they believed it. How astounding. What a thought that challenges me today. That they believed the word of God even when they couldn't understand it. When they couldn't know how it was going to come true. When they had to just believe it by, by faith. They believed it. And the Bible says that when they had faith, it was credited to them as righteousness. And that's why they were in paradise and not in hell. That's why they were going to be, be led out of paradise and going to be taken to heaven because they had believed. So they didn't need an invitation. And what about those in hell? Well, it was too late for them. They, they, they now saw the truth and they now believed that Jesus really was the Messiah and they believed he died on the cross for, for sin. They probably even believed that he really was just about to rise from the dead. I mean, he had done everything else. But you see, it was too late to invite him to become the Lord of their life. You know, they couldn't trust in Jesus because their lives were over. Their opportunity was gone. There may have been some that said... Hey, but we didn't know. We didn't know. We never heard the promises of, of Messiah. It's not that we rejected it. And Jesus may have explained to them, no, but you had the testimony of creation. Every morning when you got up, every day when you looked up in the sky, there was the testimony of all these things that had been made, things that were wonderful and beautiful and beyond your comprehension and exceedingly complex. And when your soul asks the question, how did these things be? How, how did they come about? You never responded, there must be God. Because if you had just decided there must be a God, and I want to know that God, I want to seek that God, he would have said, my father promised that if you would seek him with all of your heart, you would find him. He would see to it. He would send you the revelation you needed to understand so that you could believe that Messiah was coming and you would have an opportunity to be saved. But you rejected the testimony of creation. And in so doing, you rejected your creator and you rejected your savior. So there's no invitation for those that are in hell. Folks, I want us to understand there is no second chance. Our opportunity to respond to the Lord Jesus who died upon the cross and paid for our sin, who offers to forgive us if we trust in him and if we commit our lives to him and follow him, is now. It's while we are still living and we can invite him to become the Lord and the master of our lives. That's when our opportunity is. There was then, there is now. No second chance. Our opportunity to believe is right now while we live and breathe. Stand with me. Let's pray. Spirit of God, you know as you move among the hearts of men and women here in this place, you know those that belong to Jesus because they have trusted him as Lord and Savior and those who have not yet trusted him. Even among those that may be very religious, 
but have not yet trusted Jesus, you know the difference. Spirit of God, convict us in our heart of which we are. I pray that for whatever man, whatever woman is here today, but has not trusted Jesus as their Lord and Master, as the one to reign over their life, even as he reigns over it all. I pray you would convict them and convince them of their lostness, of their need for Christ. That if they were to die, suddenly they would wake up and find themselves in flame and torment in hell without another chance. Convince them that these words are true, that today is the day of salvation, that now is the appointed time. That the scripture calls saying, today if you hear his voice, do not reject the plea as in the rebellion. And I pray today that they would choose to trust in Christ. Now if you're one of those for whom I've just prayed and you want to be saved, you want to trust in Christ, then just in the quiet of your heart, pray a prayer like this with me right now. Dear Jesus, I do believe you are God's son. And I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. You are alive right now. And Jesus, I repent of all that sin that has been in my life. I turn away from it. And I invite you to come into my life. Jesus, I want you to be not only my Savior, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be the master, the boss, the king of my life. I want you to reign over me like you reign over the universe. Beginning this moment, I will follow you. Beginning this moment, I want to obey you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, right after we worship and as soon as we're dismissed, go over to our Next Steps desk. Tell the pastor that will be there. Let them help you in knowing what your next step is. Now, let's worship the Lord. Father's arms are open. 